We're getting close to the end of this book. Uh, it's been a good prophecy. Several weeks ago, we finished chapter 45. I had given you a little paper map to keep and, and hold on to, and it kind of applies through the rest of this. Um, some of it's detailed, which we'll move through a little swiftly, and some things I might want to pause at. Um, we could potentially finish the book tonight, um, although it usually doesn't go that way. <laughs> so let's dive in. Let's see what, what happens. I will read, pray, and, and then we'll discuss it. So thus says the Lord God, the gateway of the inner court that faces towards the east shall be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be open. And on the day of the new moon, it shall be open. The prince shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gate from the outside and stand by the gate post. The priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering. He shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go out, but the gate shall not be shut until evening. And likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the entrance of this gate before the Lord on the Sabbath and the new moon. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord, as we approach this text, that you would continue to open it to us, Lord, that we would, uh, Lord, have not only understanding of the word that's before us, but even your nature and your character. I pray that you would remove all things that might distract us now in our hearts and our minds and anything else that's outside of this room, Lord, and allow us to just focus our attention on, uh, in on you and what you would have to say through this text. We love you. We thank you this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So if you remember, um, those of you who have been around, anybody here for the first time, by the way? Anybody new? Okay, perfect. So you've seen this layout. Hopefully you remember it. And as we get into this, what you're noticing is that's that the gateway of the inner court, God is that faces towards the east. Remember, this is the east gate. If you remember the layout of this whole compound is about one square mile. Um, and then it leads up to the temple compound. And then you have the three gates. Y'all remember the three gates? There's the gate that faces towards the east. And there's also a southern gate and a northern gate. Um, but when you go through that gate, the first gate, it lets you into the outer court. Hey, Y'all remember this, right? And then there's another gate that allows you into the inner court. And even if it's your first time going through the book of Ezekiel, if you've been through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, the tabernacle, all laid out the same. And, and what we're going to see as we go through these last few chapters, actually, is that this is, a, this is a pattern that is divine. The layout of the tabernacle, the later temple, this whole layout that we're seeing in Ezekiel, as well as, to some degree, the New Jerusalem that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, um, there's a pattern that's being kept all the way through all of this. There's some commonality to it, and we know that it's because the tabernacle and the temple were designed as a pattern or after the pattern or the type of the heavenly scene, which we now understand after reading the book of Revelation. So a lot of this layout, this is the divine, holy layout which the Lord likes. So when I don't fully understand it, I come to a realization it's okay. I'll get, gain greater understanding when I get there, but it's the way he wants it to be, and I'm good with that. Because he died on the cross for me, so I'm good with however he wants to lay it out. You know, I don't care how he decorates it and lay it out. Well, yeah, that's up to him, and I'm good with it. But just so you have an understanding, we've looked at the maps of these things already. So this is the, the east gate, and it's particularly it's the second one, so it's the inner one, the one that leads to the inner court. And so remember, as you go into the inner court, that's where the altar and all of that stuff is um, as you lead up to the sanctuary. So it says the inner court that faces towards the east, it shall be shut six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be open. And on the day of the new moons, it shall be open. And I like that. You know, during the six days are the days where, you know, the labor happens, the work, the common things. Even the Lord labored for six days and on the seventh he rested. We know that from all the way back in Genesis. And so for Israel, it was the same thing. They could labor for six days and on the seventh day they would rest. It would be Sabbath. And what we're even seeing here is that that's a picture not just of physical rest. Physical rest is good, isn't it? Amen. But physical rest 
without real rest doesn't always yield what you need. I mean, the body does need rest. I mean, the land needed rest, we see in the Old Testament. You let the land rest, it produces more if you give it that, that one year of rest and, and all of that kind of stuff. But the rest I'm really mentioning is the rest that's in him. Because what we're seeing is that on those, on those Sabbath and new moons, that it would be open because those would be the days in which people could come and see and worship the Lord Jesus during the millennium. Remember, this is the millennium uh, kingdom, the millennium temple. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. And so on those days, it would be open. And uh, I just, I love the fact that it's going to be open. And that we'll see the people will be able to come through. They'll be able to gaze upon the Lord. The Lord will be somewhat accessible. And he'll be worshipped. And he's worthy to be worshipped. And so real rest happens, honestly, when I and you are in his presence, worshiping him, being renewed in him, because we're designed to worship him. So I think that when we worship him, something happens to renew us spiritually. I think we don't understand it sometimes. We think maybe having to go and worship, you know, and, and there's a chore to it. I'd rather stay in, in in my pajamas. But no, man, something happens. There's a release that takes place when we just go and worship the Lord because we were designed to do that. Amen. Um, and, and so... I love the fact that it's going to be open on those days. And then verse two, the prince, he can enter. Now remember the prince. We've identified the prince previously. He seems to be um, either David or a descendant of David. Um, we've looked at those verses in times past. But the prince shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gateway from the outside. So he's coming in from the outer courtyard and he enters in at the, the vestibule, the entryway to the the eastern gate that leads into the inner court. And he goes in and he stands by the gate post. So he doesn't enter fully in because nobody enters, remember, but the Lord himself. That's why it's always short because the Lord shut because the Lord has entered in from the previous chapters. We realize that no one enters that gate but the Lord. But the prince can go in there by the doorpost. He gets to worship close to the Lord. And I like that, especially if it's David. Because David, all he ever wanted to do was worship and be close to the Lord. He gets this spot, if it's him, close to the Lord. He gets to worship in that way. So he draws close. You know, and honestly, you know, I, I know this is focused on, on, on Israel and, and the millennium. But there's so many truths for us. I mean, do you long to be close to him? To really be able to worship him? To not feel like you're going through the motions, but just have this vibrant longing desire to see him and be near to him, the lover of your soul. Um, that's an amazing thing to want to worship the Lord. And, um, you know, because when we worship him, we are actually doing our heavenly thing. You, just read, you read it in Revelation. When we get there, we're going to worship in ways we can't even understand. It's going to be so it's going to blow us away. I mean, people go to these concerts and all this stuff, you know, and, and they, they, they get all excited about this stuff, you know, like it's something. It's all manufactured. You know, you got the speakers blasting and this going on and that going on and all the hype. Man, that's nothing. Did you read Revelation 5? No. Did you read 4 and 5 of Revelation? There's, there's, there's nothing like that on earth. I mean, to see him and be so blown away that you fall flat on your face and you don't get hurt. And, you get, and then you get to get up and see him again and just like, man, it's so overwhelmingly pleasing. I think that's what we sometimes don't get. It's so overwhelmingly pleasing to us because we were created to be in his presence that way. And it's just going to blow us away. And so I, I love this. And so the prince, he can enter in. He stands by the, by the, uh, the uh, gate post. And the priest, notice, they'll, they'll prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering. So he's not a, this prince is not a priest, but he gets to draw close. And he shall worship at the threshold of the gate, this cl the closest position. Then he shall go out. But the gate shall not be shut until evening. And so he gets to worship. We're going to find out that that's not the only time he gets to worship on the new moon and the Sabbath. But this is how uh, he'll go through that process. Um, now, notice in verse three, likewise, and I, I like that term because likewise, it says the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to the gateway. Let me pause and remind you, especially the youth who are not in here with us every week as we go through Ezekiel. So the people who are worshiping uh, in this setting are the inhabitants of not just the land of Israel, 
But we also know that people from around the, the world during the millennium will come from all the nations to worship him. These are people who survived the tribulation and are believers. So they are allowed by the Lord to go into the millennium uh, and inhabit the earth in their resurrected, uh, excuse me, in their um, human form. And they will worship the Lord. And so um, we will be resurrected at this point. Y'all remember me kind of going through that process. And so there will be this constant worship coming to Jerusalem to worship the Lord Jesus. So likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the entrance to this gateway before the Lord on the Sabbath. And so there's some, some particular things for the for the Jews during the millennium promises that need to be fulfilled. But all uh, people of the nations will also come. It says in verse four, the burnt offerings that the, the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. There'll be six, uh, seven sacrifices there. And that's actually more than what you see if you go back into the law and you look at what was required on, on, uh, on the Sabbaths. This is actually more, it's more extensive actually. And the grain offering shall be one ephah for a ram and the grain offering for the lambs as much as he wants to give as well as a hen of oil with every ephah. And we're going to see as much as he wants to give and a couple of voluntary offerings. And I love this because, yes, there, there are the prescribed things that we should do. But because of relationship and love, um, there are things that we get to do. There are things that we get to do. I think going to church on Sunday is a must because we're not the forsake assembly. I'm talking about the church. But to serve in the children's ministry is a treat or the parking lot ministry. That becomes a treat. You know, do that because I, I, I'd like to do that. And I'm called. I feel I feel a, 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 a need to do that because it's to honor him. Uh, and so, you know, there are things that we get to do. And sometimes I think we, we, we forget that we think serving is we got to do. Oh, I got to do this. You ain't got to do nothing. Trust me. I'd rather have the, the people who just I get to do, you know, those are the ones who we really want to see show up. Um, five, it says, so the grain offering shall be one ephah for a ram and the grain offering for the lambs as much as he wants to give, as well as a hen of oil with every ephah. And, and so, you know, these these speak of the peace offerings that they get to enjoy. Verse six on uh, the day of the new moon, it shall be a young bull without blemish, six lambs and a ram. And they shall be without blemish. Um, he shall prepare a grain offering and an ephah for the bull and ephah for the rams as much as he wants to give for the lambs. I love that. And a hen of oil with every ephah. Um, oil makes it better, you know. And uh, it's, a, it's definitely a, a peace offering that they will enjoy. Verse 8, when the prince enters, he shall go in by way of the vestibule of the gateway and go out the same way. In other words, he'll enter in to the, the vestibule of the, the east gate to the inner court, worship there before the Lord. Then he'll go out the same way that he came in. He will not go through that, uh, that gate into the inner court. Does everybody get that? Okay, so he's drawing close to worship, but then he goes back out the way that he came in. So he's drawing close to worship, but then he goes back out the way that he came in. And it will be his honor and his privilege to enjoy that close worship before the Lord through that whole millennium. And, and that's going to be just a wonderful thing, particularly if it is David. But uh, that's awesome. And then the people get the worship in a similar fashion. Verse nine. But when the people of the land come before the Lord on the appointed feast days, we're going to see some differences. Notice whoever enters by way of the north gate to worship shall go out by way of the south gate. And whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by way of the north gate. He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go out through the opposite gate. Now, when you look at those verses, you wonder, well, why is that? You know, the people are coming to worship the Lord. And so when they arrive at the compound and they're making their way up to the um, actual uh, gates to the outer court, whichever gate they go in, they can't go back out that way. They have to go through and out the other side. OK, why? Well, maybe practically and, and I'll, I'll go with this for a moment, maybe practically. And if you're in ministry, this will make sense to you. 
you know, there's, there needs to be a little bit of traffic control because, you know, people can be, the Lord's sheep can be very chaotic if you allow them. <laughs> Can't we be? You know, so, yeah, I can see that, man, this is for trial, tri uh, traffic control because you got thousands of people by the hour coming through to worship the Lord and that could get pretty congested. So you want to keep the lines moving and I can see some people thinking that and that's a good practical reason to see it. I do think that there's some spiritual symbolism to it, though. Because as I draw close to worship him, and if I get a glimpse of him, then I'm not going to be the same. And I think to some degree, going out a different way speaks of the fact that I just had this, this amazing impact from having him gaze my eyes upon the one who purchased my salvation, and it changes me. And I think that the beauty of us as spiritual beings now living this life in the spirit that we now have is we get to do that every day. You know, I think you say, well, Pastor Kevin, we don't see the Lord. No, we don't. We don't gaze our eyes upon him yet. But if you go into his presence, I tell you, you don't walk away from it the same way you entered. You know, and I think that's something that we need to know and understand. And, and uh, when you see glimpses of that in the scripture, when in Isaiah you all know chapter 6 when uh, the year that King Uzziah died. How many of you remember those, those verses? I saw the Lord in the temple high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple and all this kind of stuff. And he fell down and said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He, had, he, he, he came to the realization that God is holy. The Lord Jesus is holy and amazing. And, and I'm not. You know? And as you go through scripture, it's always that way. I remember when Peter had a moment to come to the realization of Christ. And it was simply because Peter argued with the Lord, as he often did. Have y'all have noticed how many times Peter argues with the Lord in the scriptures? Okay. So it was one of the times he's arguing with the Lord about, look, we fished all night. You know, Jesus, he said, Jesus used his boat. And he says, okay, now I want to I wanna, I wanna pay you for my, my use of your boat. So cast your nets. Man, ain't no, the fish ain't biting today, Lord. We already did this. And that's going to happen. Cast your nets, you know. And then they couldn't, they couldn't pull the fish in. And Peter broke down and like, you know, depart from me. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. You know, comes to a realization of just Christ and his power. And we have those moments in our life, you know. And so when I think about going in one way and coming out the other, I think about all of those things, you know. Um, uh, how often when I leave his presence, I'm different. You know, you get up in the morning, you can be in a, in a, in a bad mood. And you just go sit down with your Bible and, and you get before the Lord and, and he straightens you out. Well, at least he straightens me out. And I walk away feeling like, and the Lord depart from me. I'm a sinful man. I'm like Peter at that point. <laughs> so they go in one gate. They got to go out the other gate. I mean, you can take from that whatever you see. Yes, there are some practicalities to it. We need to, there needs to be organization. Anytime there's a ministry that Jesus is involved in, there's always going to be some organization, right? Jesus teaches his disciples to do that all the time. You remember the people? He fed the 5,000 people. What did Jesus say to the disciples? Hey, make them sit down in groups, okay? And then we're going to start distributing and put them in certain groups in certain places so that we can keep this thing organized and whatnot. Because Jesus don't like cutting line and stuff. That's an issue, you know. But uh, so he got them straightened out. So, yes, there's organization, but I think there's a, even a deeper meaning. Verse 11, I'm going to try to move here. It says, so at the festivals, I'm sorry, verse 10. Verse 10 says, the prince shall then be in their midst when they go in. He shall go in, and when they go out, he shall go out. Now, the prince, remember, is not referring to the Lord. Uh, the Lord is referred to as the Lord. The prince, as we keep identifying, is worshiping the Lord. He's, he's, he's offering sacrifices before the Lord as a memorial. So the prince is either David, as I said, or descendant of David, as we've seen through the scripture. But the beauty is, even though he has this wonderful position and even title as a prince, and he gets to draw very close. Um, and then there's even a, a verse that we've looked at where he gets to sit and eat before the Lord and all of this. But the reality is, um, aside from that, he's just in the midst of the people worshiping the Lord because that's the reality of it. You know, when you think about there's Jesus and then there's us. I always give you the org chart and we all worship him uh, and we come to worship him and there, there's there's none greater than the other. We're, we're, we're all coming to him, uh, you know, in an equal fashion. And so we see this. Um, and as we're going to go through this, we're going to begin to see that in this millennium, the Lord has ordered things the way that 
We desire them to be now, but they're not. Because now in the time we live in, there are men, whether it's secular government or even within the church, that lift themselves up above others. And remember what Jesus taught his disciples. He says, hey, you know, he who's greatest among you must be sl actually slave of all. You know, and so we, we learn, we learn that verse 11. So it says at the festivals and at the appointed feast days, the grain offering shall be an ephah for a bull and an ephah for a ram as much as he wants to give for the lamb and a hen of oil with every ephah. And now when the prince makes notice a voluntary burnt offering or a voluntary peace offering to the Lord, notice this, the gate that faces towards the east shall then be opened for him and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offering as he did notice on the Sabbath day, then he shall go out and after he goes out, the gate shall be shut. I don't know if you caught that. So he, he's going to do this on the Sabbath and on the new moon. That's kind of regular, right? But there are times when he can just make a voluntary offering before he just gets up one day, man, you know, the Lord is too good. If this is David, this is going to happen every day. <laughs> because, you know, David, look, the gate's going to open every day because David's going to show up with an offering for the Lord just because I know I know he is. If, that, if this is David and I would I would love that. You know, you get to make voluntary offers just because God is good. You don't have to wait to the Sabbath. You know, this is obviously a Jewish scene because the worship takes place on Sabbath, every Sabbath. But he gets to the prince gets to worship Whenever he just has a voluntary offering that he wants to bring before the Lord, he's going to be able to do this and he's going to be able to bring that burnt offering and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath days. He can go through those, those same uh, offering processes anytime he wants to do a voluntary offering. And I love that um, because the Lord is accessible to him in that way throughout the millennium. That's a beautiful thing, y'all, um, as he's accessible to us. He's accessible to us, even more so, even more so, because we've been born of his spirit. So the Bible says in Hebrews that we can boldly come in um, and worship him. And the Lord is never, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There, there's no hindrance. What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Well, nothing, according to the book of Romans. There's absolutely nothing that can get between you and the Lord. The only thing that can hinder you from worshiping the Lord at any given time is the fact that you don't want to draw close. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in a prison cell. You can be, you can, you can, you can have a tube down your throat land in the hospital, but there's nothing that can hinder you from getting before him and worshiping him. Amen. You know, nothing, absolutely nothing. And so he says, you shall daily make a burnt offering to the Lord of a lamb of the first year without blemish. You shall prepare it every morning. You shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, um, a sixth of an ephah and a third of a hen of oil to moisten the, the fine flour. This grain offering is a perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the Lord. Thus, he shall prepare the lamb, the grain offering, and the oil as a regular burnt offering every morning. Um, Verse 16 through 18, we begin, begin to look at some of the inheritances that go on. And so we, we, as we get into all of this detail, um, very clearly we understand that this is, during the millennium, um, this is an actual kingdom, millennium kingdom, where these things will be practiced throughout that millennium there in the city there in Israel. Notice it says in verse 16, thus says the Lord God, if the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons. Remember the map I gave you a few weeks ago. There's a section of the city that is given to, or, or, or the land that's given to the prince, okay? And there's a reason for that we're going to find out. And so if he were to give a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, and again, people, some commentaries you may read that try to say that the prince here is the Lord Jesus just lost their case. Jesus doesn't have any sons. Okay, we good? All right, we understand that. All right, so it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. But if he gives a gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his until the year of liberty, kind of like the year of Jubilee, 
after which it shall return to the prince. But his inheritance shall belong to his sons. It shall become theirs. So there's a distinction being made um, here that the prince who now has a section of the land given to him, he can give as a, a gift a portion of that land to any of his sons. Then it becomes theirs. OK, um, but if he gave a gift to a servant that in the year of liberty, the year of jubilee, the year in which all debts are forgiven and all lands return to their original owner, it would then go back to the prince. And so this will actually take place during the millennium as well. So it's very interesting to see um, that ordinance being placed here. Uh, verse 18, moreover, the prince shall not take any of the people's inheritance by evicting them from their property. He shall provide an inheritance for his sons from his own property so that none of my people may be scattered from his property. What in the world is going on here and why? Well, in former times, prior to the millennium, what we've been reading in the Old Testament as you go through, um, the kings of Israel became very wicked and they often would uh, impound, if you will, or evict people and take their land. One noticeable example we have is when Ahab wanted the land, the vineyard of a particular man and and he wanted it so bad that Jezebel uh, helped him get it. They, they basically took it from the guy. Y'all remember that and had him killed. And, and so, um, you know, God says, no, 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 no. That will not happen during the millennium. Why? Because during the millennium, what's the distinct difference between the millennial reign of Christ and the time we live in now? Jesus reigns on the throne with a rod of iron. And he just said that ain't happening. So I'm going to make sure that the prince has his own section and he can give gifts to his his uh, sons, uh, his offspring from that. Uh, but none of my people will have their land taken away because Jesus is going to carry out um, a righteous rule upon the earth. And so he makes this statement. He says that none of my people may be scattered from his property. And that's what we love. Um, I think people long for righteous rule now, but we can't get it. You just can't get it. The world is corrupt. Um, the world is a mess and we are moving swiftly towards the end um, and all things that we've been looking at in Ezekiel we're drawing pretty close to it I don't know if how many of you know this but uh, I have it back there there's a there's an agency within the United States that just did a ranking of nations um, uh, by by the most powerful down um, and so of course the United States is still ranked number one as the most powerful nation mainly because of our military uh, even though our economy is weakening, but um, it's still considered the, uh, the, the, uh, the most powerful nation on earth. China was number two, but the amazing thing about the report is guess who showed up in the top ten? Israel. Israel. Not even as big as New Jersey. Deemed number ten of the most powerful nations in the world. Why? Well, for one, they have the number four most powerful military. How could you accomplish that, being one of the smallest nations on the planet, unless God was lending them favor because we're moving towards the last day scenario. Now, Russia was in there and Turkey and the different ones in there and, uh, and whatnot. And, and you, you just see hints of it all uh, kind of moving in the direction that we see that things are gonna go in according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. But this little nation of Israel is in the top 10 of the most powerful nations in the world because of their technology, because of their military might, because of everything that the scriptures told that would be accomplished in them in the last days when he would bring them back and gather them from all nations. So it's amazing where we're headed, um, but I wanna, I wanna stay on task. So verse 19 now, down through verse 24, um, gets into the, how the offerings are prepared. Notice verse 19 says, now, he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate on the holy, uh, into the holy chambers of the priest, which faced towards the north. And there a place was situated at the extreme western end. And he said to me, this is the place where the priest shall boil the, the, the uh, trespass offerings and the sin offerings and where they shall bake the grain offerings so that they do not bring them out into the outer court to sanctify the people. In other words, he's provided, uh, and you can go back and look at the previous maps that we've looked at, but there's a section where they do all of this stuff so that they don't bring 
contaminate, if you will, that which is now deemed holy into the outer court. So they'll prepare it all in that section. Verse 21, then he brought me out into the outer court and caused me to pass by the four corners of the outer court. And in fact, in every corner of the uh, court, there was another court. In other words, there's these little section off courtyards in each one of the four corners that's separate from the greater outer court. Um, verse 22, in the four corners of the court were enclosed courts, 40 cubits long, 30 wide, and um, all four corners were the same size. There, were a, there was a row of building stones all around them, all around the four of them, and cooking uh, hearths were made under the rows of the stones all around. And he said to me, these are the kitchens where the ministers of the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. And so they have this massive production going on there at the temple. And you have to imagine one of the things during the millennium is that people are living, well, we're about to get into it, but they're going to be living longer, right? Remember that? A child will die at 200 years old if, if that happens. So people will be living five, six, 700 years again. Um, and so the population is going to begin to spike up. So there'll be thousands of thousands upon thousands of people worshiping every day coming through um, and every week coming through from, from all over the, the, the world at that point. So there's going to be a massive production taking place. All right. For chapter 47. Y'all doing all right? Yeah. All right. Chapter 47 is good. Notice we get to um, a section I really like. Now just jump in. So then he brought me back to the door of the temple. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east. And we've already covered that. Okay, the eastern gate, the temple faces east. And so that's the main gate, even though no one enters in that one, but because of the Lord. But there's water coming out. Notice the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. So if you're looking at the temple approaching at the east, you can't go in that gate. But if you remember what that looks like, if you look to your left, coming from the threshold is this little flow of water. Um, and if you look at it from the Hebrew, it's not a gushing thing happening here. It's, it's more of a, of a small flow, a, a trickle, if you will, steady coming uh, from there. And he brought me out by way, verse 2, of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces east and there was water running out the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and brought me through the water. The waters came up to my ankles. And I did the math earlier. I don't have it in front of me, but 1,000 cubits. If you remember, a cubit's 21, 21 inches. And so if you multiply that times 1,000, you come up with a number that I don't have in front of me. Okay, And then you do the math to factor that um, into feet. And then you find out how many feet are in a mile. And this number puts you at about one third the distance of a mile. You follow me? So about one third the distance of a mile from the front of the, of the, of the, uh, the temple, this water flows out about the depth up to your ankles. And that was kind of special. And I'll tell you why as we read on. Verse 4. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters. The waters came up to my knees. So now we're about two-thirds of a mile out from the temple. The water has increased to a depth of about a man's knee, a couple of feet now. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, and it came to my waist. And so at this point, you're right at a mile distance from the temple which kind of gets you out of the compound now, and it's up to, to the waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. And I, I, I look at that, and I'm like, man, you know, it's amazing. At this point, about a mile and a, and a third out from the temple, now it's a, a flowing river that you can't walk across. 
but about a third of a mile from the gate of the temple, it's about up to the ankle. Mm. I like that. I know when you go to the water parks or the splash parks and you got the little toddlers, even the little babies can play in the water because it's only, you know, it's about ankle deep and they can just, they can, they don't even have to worry about drowning. Parents can just let them play in, in the water, you know, and I, I guess kind of begin to think about this, you know, because near to the Lord is safe and it's a blessing and it's easy. He leads me beside still waters. And the further you get away from him, the deeper it gets. And I think about that because the further I drift away from the Lord, you can get in some pretty deep water pretty quick, you know. And man, but, but close to him is easy um, and it's safety. And I, I just thought about that as I look at this. And so it's a gentle flow when it flows right out of the temple and it gets a little deeper the further away from the place of worship that you go. Um, it's just a picture that's to, to stay close to the Lord always. But why is this water there? What's this water all about? Well, as we continue to read, we'll see. Verse 6, he says, he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me, and of course he's seen it because he's taken him through all of it, you know. <laughs> and so then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned there along the bank of the river was very many trees on one side and the other. In other words, there's trees on both sides. Then he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. We'll talk about that in a moment. And when it reaches the sea, the waters are healed. So it goes down, reaches the really the Dead Sea is what we're talking about. The water is healed there. And it shall be that every living thing that moves whenever, wherever the river goes will live. And there will be a very great multitude of fish. Now, this began to, to bless my heart here. Because um, I like the fish. <laughs> and so, I imagine Peter and I, I'm, I'm going to see if Peter wants to uh, go check this area out with me and, uh, when we get there. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from Engedi to Engleum. They will place their spreading, uh, they will uh, be places there for spreading their nets. Their fish will be, notice this, the same kinds as the fish of the great sea exceedingly many the great sea would be the Mediterranean so in other words the fish down here in this Dead Sea area today will be like the fish that come out of the Mediterranean that go to the ocean and now those of you who do fish you understand what this is you know because we can go to most of the lakes in North Carolina and you might get some decent sized striped bass and some different things and some find some decent bass from time to time and that's great but it's not the same as pulling like a blue marlin or or maybe pulling even a even a 20 20 something inch snapper out of the, the the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it's just a different type of fish. You guys, you agree? Yeah. It, but literally, it says it's going to be of the same quality. These are going to be these fish are going to be uh, flourishing. They're going to be good. Um, it's going to be amazing. Um, and notice it says here exceedingly many. That's amazing. So people will be lined up to fish in a place that people don't get any. Nothing lives there now. And it says, but um, its swamps and its marshes will not be healed. They will be given to salt. So there'll still be some areas, some marsh areas with salt. But the, the Dead Sea itself is going to be healed. And it says, and along the banks of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees. Notice this used for food. Their leaves will, will not wither. And their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. So because it comes from the sanctuary, from the presence of the Lord, it's going to heal everything. And the trees will bear fruit every month of the year. There will be fruit. Can you imagine that? That's, that's crazy. Because here we got seasons now. You got a season where you can get this fruit and that fruit from different regions of the world. But all year long, these trees will be yielding fruit. Notice the fruit will be for food, but their leaves, notice, will be for what, y'all? Yes. Medicine. This is going to be interesting. I think this is what the Lord really intended from the beginning, you know. We were, we were intended to live forever, so there was a tree of life in the garden. 
and the tree of life would sustain life and repair. There would be no diminishing DNA or anything like that. We don't even know what human DNA is supposed to be because it's hindered. There, it's, 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 parts of it is broken. Um, and so we've learned of DNA. We've learned of that information and we tamper with it a little bit. But we're flawed. We're, we're, we're falling. We're deteriorating. Our DNA is not even complete. So we don't even really know what we're supposed to be like um, because of the fall and because we don't have that life sustaining uh, tree of life anymore. But during the millennium, there'll be these trees and there'll be healing and, and, the, and the whole the whole all of the waters of the earth will be healed. Because remember, um, coming out of the tribulation, all the waters damaged. Uh, remember Revelation chapter uh, eight. Y'all remember that um, and all of the things that f that it came down wormwood and all of the other things that destroyed and uh, a third of the waters, the air quality, everything was 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 damaged. And so but here during the millennium, we see that from the threshold of the temple, from the presence of the Lord will flow this water. Now, it's very interesting that we see this here really quick. Turn over to Zechariah just so I can give you a, a different glimpse of this. Zechariah, probably somewhere between 12 and 14. I think we're going to look at 14. Yeah, we'll look at 14. Zechariah 14, to the right. To the right. You know, I know school of ministry is open, over, but, you know, <laughs> don't neglect the table of contents during the week. You know, have, be familiar with your, your sword and where the sharp edges are and all that kind of stuff. You know, know where, know where the books are. So in chapter 14, um, day of the Lord, Lord has brought judgment and wrath and, and he returns and takes over. And in chapter 14, I won't go through all of it, um, but picking it up in verse 6, it says, um, it says, and it shall come to pass on that day. In other words, you go read this in your homework, in your own time. The Lord has returned. It's come to pass on that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. And it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. And in that day it shall be that living water will flow from Jerusalem, have of them towards the Eastern Sea, which we just looked at. Um, and then the other half towards the Western Sea, which is the great, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. So the Eastern Sea would be the Dead Sea, then the, and then you have the Mediterranean Sea. So remember the Lord comes back, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. It, it, you know, it splits from North to this, and the South, a valley goes through. Obviously he, the topology of all of this stuff changes. So when we look at the current map of Jerusalem and all that stuff, there's gonna be a change that's gonna take place, which we don't quite, know what that's going to be but this water will flow and so it will go in both directions and it will heal everything that it touches and notice it says in both summer and winter it will occur so year round there will be this flow of water and the lord shall be king over what the earth in that day it shall be the lord is one and his name is one and you can go read all of that in your own time and so it seems that in this millennium situation the Lord ruling and reigning from right there, his throne in the temple in Jerusalem, this water will go forth and it will heal the earth. It will provide um, nourishment to these trees, which will be for food year round, as well as the leaves of those trees will be for medicine. And that's going to be very, very interesting to even just begin to think about. So that will be the, the millennium reign here on the earth. Um, and it's amazing God is fulfilling his promises to Israel as we're looking at it in Ezekiel. But there's this other thing that he has prepared for his, his wife, the Lord does, which is even more grand. Really quick while we got a few minutes. Y'all got a few minutes? Let's go to Revelation 21, 22. We'll look at both of them. Um, you know, it's really good that there's been this COVID calls this mixing up of like Everything got shook up. A lot of church congregations got mixed, which is a good thing, actually. I think that was the Lord's thing. Um, and uh, it's good because here we arrive together and we have all of this stuff in our heads that we probably picked up along the way from somewhere. But as we look at the scriptures, all of it's getting sorted out. 
you might have some teachers that confuse you and try to say that what we were just looking at in Ezekiel has to do with, with, with what we're about to look at here in Revelation. The reality is we're looking at two different cities. Here in Revelation 21, verse 9, the angel, I won't go through all of this, but it says, um, you know, at the beginning, new heaven, new earth. And then verse 9, it says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And I like that. What, what does he mean? Well, of course, we coming back with some new digs, y'all. We, we in this new thing that's going on. And he says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me. He had to get to a high mountain to see this thing and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven. Now, as I've always told you, you can go back and listen to the Revelation teaching. This city that descends out of heaven, it looks more like a moon because of the size of it. And I, 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 you have, I need you to go do your own homework. I won't do it. But if you glance ahead um, where it, it talks about it is, is big, verse 14, uh, 12 foundations. We know that. Um, it is laid out, verse 16, a perfect square. We find out that it's a cube. Okay, if you imagine a cube with 12 foundations and 12 gates. Um, and, then, and then if you, uh, let's see, where am I at? I need to get ahead of here. Verse 16, it says it's, it's, it's um, check it out. It's, it's, the city is laid out as a, it's, uh, laid out as a square. Its length um, is as great as its breadth. So it is a cube. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. I won't spend time here, but we're somewhere between 1,300 and 1,500 miles Per side, okay. So this city, the new city, the Jerusalem, where the church will dwell, you can't fit it in a town. You can't fit it in a like a state. If we use the the United States of America as a measuring uh, rod for this thing, it's taken up a third. It it would take up a third of the United States of America, one side of it. You follow me? But there's twelve foundations. So go back and listen to this. It's amazing. So this city's descending out of heaven. And, and, and it doesn't actually ever say it touches down. It's like a moon in the sky, if you will. This is where we're going to live. And he talks about all of this. Verse 22 says there is no temple in it. So we know it's not the same thing we looked at in Ezekiel. There is no temple for the Lord Almighty, um, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So they dwell in the midst and we don't, we don't have to have a temple there. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in, in it for the glory of God illuminated it. Um, the lamb is its light. So we understand that this new city, we're, we're spiritual beings anyway. So we're going to be just like the Lord, according to John. We don't yet know what he is, what, what we're going to be, John says. But we know that when we see him, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. So we'll be with the Lord in this location. And I, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a glimpse of it there so we can jump into chapter 22, because chapter 22 I want you to notice the pattern that we keep seeing. Chapter 22, verse 1. You, you there? Yes. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. I always like that. There's, a, there's this throne now. And they share it, kind of. It's interesting to me. I don't want to... You can listen to the Revelation teaching. I got into it in detail, I guess, there. Notice it says, in the middle of the street of its street, and on either side of the river, notice was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Paul's. If you go back into chapter 21 again, um, verse 24 says, the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So they walk in its light. And literally, it's like a moon and they bring their glory into it. It's kind of interesting here. The, you have the healing of the nations is what the leaves are for, but it seems to be definitely different from what we just looked at in Ezekiel. All right, stay with me. In verse 3 it says, And there shall be no more curse, no death, 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. Uh, they need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Isn't that beautiful? So that's where we're going to be. But there's a pattern. Even in our new Jerusalem, from his throne flows water. And, and it yields fruit. And there's the healing of the nations. And there's these similarities that are there. This pattern that seems to persist. And this is the way God has designed it. And I, I think that um, the picture is that from all eternity, there will be these nations on the earth. Because remember, God says that he will have a throne there forever. Remember that? As we looked at in Ezekiel. Um, but then this city, Jerusalem, where the bride lives. So you got to catch this. He made promises to Israel. They will have a everlasting kingdom. That will be upon the earth. But the bride is different. The wife we're going to become, I should say, is different. And he has an eternal glory even prepared for us. I know it can be a little confusing to see all of it. And I just love meditating upon it. I hope you fall, fall in love with it as well because it is grand what is laid ahead for us. You know, I think our endurance comes from pondering these things and having a longing to see these things and experience these things. It causes us to, to hold on. You know, it's, it's like, you know, what it says in Romans that the, um, go over there really quick so I don't misquote it. Romans 8 and then I'll end here. Romans 8. He says, for I consider, verse 18, 8, 3, 8, 18 Romans 8, 18. 8, 18. I consider, he says, that the sufferings of this present time. Now, you got to understand, Paul said in another place that he knew a man, whether in the spirit or in the flesh, I cannot tell, speaking of himself. That was caught up in, into the, the third heavens and heard things unlawful to mention. Y'all remember those verses? And so, you know, because he's heard some stuff, he didn't even say he saw anything. So he just heard some stuff. And so he, he says here, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He says our, our eternal state and position and glory is state in Christ is so grand, there's nothing down here we can go through that's even worthy to be compared with that. That's what he's saying to us. This is how we're supposed to be living. We're supposed to begin to, to, to meditate on these things and grasp these things until they cause us to be heavenly minded so that we can actually be earthly good. Not worthy. And so, uh, anyway, that's it for tonight. <laughs> um, I hope you just go and, and spend some time in it and let the Lord bless you. We're headed somewhere. We've got a plan. I was at, uh, it was a blessing to get away. Universal Studio, Studios on New Year's Eve. And it was so many people. It was like the diff, it was like a, you could compare it to Mardi Gras and uh, Times Square and all of this at once. And it was just, it was all this stuff going on and it was, it was all uh, dead. There was a lot of dancing and music and cheering, and it was all dead. It was all dead. And so we have something so better than anything this world can fabricate, and we get distracted so easily from it. But the, the scriptures are screaming at us. He's got something laid up for you. And Jesus says, hey, I go to prepare a place for you. I mean, he wasn't playing. We, we, I mean, it's, it's going to be something we can't, we can't imagine. And so no matter what you're going through and how you feel, this is what we hold on to. This is what we long to see. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for putting your scriptures before us, Lord. I pray that you would continue to lead us, guide us, Lord God, and through the rest of this week. I pray that you would encourage each person here, Lord God, that we would get out of ourselves, Lord, and focus our, our attention on you, relying on you, trusting in you, Lord God. I pray that if there are any struggling with that, Lord, that you would, you would teach them how to do that, Lord God. Remove distractions, I pray. 
push the enemy back and set a boundary for him as we finish this week until we gather again on Sunday. I pray that you would give each person in this room victory in their walk, victory over sin and temptation, discouragement, anything, Lord God, that's not of you. Encourage them, strengthen them, and keep them, I pray. Fill their hearts with your joy. Let their joy be full, Lord God. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll sing.